be free from the burden of sin. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would your evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the breast of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's side. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin saints are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood. power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. If you would turn over to hymn number 361. Hymn number 361. blessing over the offering this morning. Holy Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be here in this place and worship and praise and honor you. Father, we thank you for the salvation that you provided through the Lord Jesus Christ so that we could have eternal life and life abundant here on this earth. Father, we just uh, want to thank you for your grace and mercy towards us, Lord. We just need that every day. We are so very grateful that it's new every morning. Your great is your faithfulness, and we are so yes. very grateful for it. Lord, we ask you now to use this offering for your honor and glory. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. May be seated.
If you would, let's stand together. Turn over to hymn number 356. Hymn number 356. <laughs> number 200 and the, after the first verse the choir will come down and we'll go around and greet each other welcome each other to the house of the lord this morning hymn number 200 there was a time on earth when in the book of heaven old account was standing for sin yet i forgive my name was at the top and many things below. I went unto the keeper and settled long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. And the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away when the old account was settled long ago.
on hymn number 200. Hymn number 200 on that last verse. Oh, sinner, seek the Lord. Repent of all your sin. For thus he hath commanded you to enter in. And then if you should live a hundred years below, up there you'll not regret it. You'll settle long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago, and the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away when the old account was settled long ago. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Turn over one more this morning to hymn number 224. Hymn number 224. Kim's got a special for us this morning. She's almost a hundred, closing the door on this life. Awoke with a questioning look to her husband. He told her it's almost midnight. She'd outlived her babies by 20 good years. 
She'd buried them all long ago But traveling back to those days lived before She earnestly needed to know Are the children all in? Are they safe? Go and check on each one Make sure they're home to stay what a peace to my heart just to hear someone say that my children are in. Noah had finally finished the boat. God commanded he build. He preached to the world of its looming destruction, but none chose to heed his appeals. Come thou and all thy house into the ark. God's voice flooded all Noah's soul. And when they were entered and God shut the door, his joy could not control all my children are in they're all saved i have looked to my father and they've chosen his way what a joy to my heart to hear my savior say that my children are in are your children all in? Are they saved? Are you molding their hearts? Are you teaching their way? Can they see a true Savior through the actions that you take, the choices that you make, the life that you're leading today? Are your children all in? Are your children all in? Are they saved? Go and check on each one. Make sure they're home to stay. Show them Jesus our Savior each possible way Till your children are in Are your children all in? Are they saved? Go and check on each one Make sure they're home to stay. Show them Jesus our Savior each possible way till your children are in. Oh, what peace and what joy to hear my Savior say that my children are in. Amen. Great message and song. Great reminder. Amen. Amen. If you would, let's take your Bibles this morning. We'll be in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter number 2. 1 Samuel chapter number 2. <clears throat> of course, if you're familiar with your Bible, you'll notice, man, we're going to be talking about Hannah. You are right. <clears throat> Amen. First Samuel chapter number two, and whenever you find your place, if you're able, let's stand together as we honor the reading of God's word this morning. First Samuel chapter two. Aren't you glad you're on the inside with all that rain going on? Amen. <clears throat> glad the roof doesn't leak. Safe, secure. Amen. Getting to hear the word of God. 1 Samuel chapter number 2, we're going to go down to verse number 18. Verse number 18. 
Whenever you find your place, if you're there, say amen. 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 All right, it says, But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, girded with a linen ephod. Now watch verse number 19. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. I want to bring our message this morning of motherhood in a single verse. Amen. Motherhood in a single verse. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your love for us and your blessings, allowing us to be able to meet together this morning around the Word of God. And Lord, I pray, Father, that you would speak to every heart, and we thank you for it and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. Now, uh, say motherhood down to a single verse, it would be absolutely impossible, wouldn't it, to be able to take everything that we know of motherhood and, and, uh, and boil that down to, uh, to one verse. But, uh, I mean, you think about it, there's been volumes that are written about the subject of motherhood, thousands of sermons that are, uh, that are preached right now today, not just throughout all of time. And, and, of course, we have all of our own personal experiences that help to add to that understanding as well. But I was reading about Hannah this week, and and, uh, and I couldn't help but see this one verse that spoke so much as to who she was as a mother. Oftentimes, uh, our identity, uh, it's, it's worth a lot more than just a title. Amen? Uh, the Proverbs 31 woman has so many identif identifiable characteristics and, and is often spoken of during Mother's Day uh, messages. I guarantee you right now there's, there's you know, several thousand books that are, uh, that are open saying, turn to Proverbs 31 and look at verse number 28. And verse 28 says, her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. You know, that praise comes because of who she is and what she does every single day. And that's the testimony that's there. The same thing is true of Hannah. Uh, her account in Scripture really isn't very uh, lengthy, but we can see in her actions she was a very godly mother. Uh, one of the things that calls our attention to Hannah is the critical timing of her being a godly mother. It was a critical time uh, as far as the, uh, not just her family, but for the entire nation. Uh, religion and politics was just beginning to, uh, to plummet. It was changing a bit. The age of the judges was drawing to an end. There was a, uh, there was a demand for a king that was uh, starting to be uh, pushed and made known. The priesthood itself had lost its reverence because of the sons of Eli and uh, the lifestyle that they were living. They didn't even believe in God and they were serving in the priesthood. You can imagine how much of a deterrent that that would be. Uh, everybody could look at the nation and see that it was not measuring up uh, to God's expectations, God's direction, what it is that He wanted, but nobody knew exactly how it was going to be remedied. They didn't really know what the answer was. It's kind of like today. Uh, we can watch our nation and see it just in a tailspin, and, and everybody's got a good idea about what it's going to take. I'll give you the short answer to return to God. Amen? Uh, but there's a lot of different programs, a lot of different things that people can put together, and yet, uh, and yet we don't know exactly how it's all going to play out. Hannah was that exact same way. Uh, Hannah didn't think that her child was going to be the one who would deliver the nation, but, but she knew the importance of him being dedicated to the Lord. Now that heart of a God godly mother would be what God would use to actually bring restoration to the nation. Now Samuel was the child that was given to Hannah by God. Uh, he's going to be the man that's going to stand between the, the old way of life and the new way of life, the, uh, the way things were going and the way that things are going to, to come to pass. He's going to be a man who's going to influence uh, the political realm. He's also going to make a drastic imp influence on the priesthood because of his spiritual understanding and because of his submission to God. So in the only way that he was ever born was because of the prayers of a godly mother. That's how he actually got there. In the beginning of uh, this book of 1 Samuel, we see uh, that was Hannah's one true desire. That's what she wanted. Her, her life, it didn't start off very good. I'll give you the catch up. Amen? And so we're going to look at our one verse here in a minute, but, I, but I'll bring you up to speed. Uh, her life wasn't always that great. Uh, and she had a loving husband, uh, but uh, there were some problems that were going on within the home and, and, uh, and as loving of a husband as her husband uh, uh, Elkanah was, he still made some bad decisions. Uh, they weren't what they should have been. He had two wives. That was a bad decision. Uh, Hannah and Hannah and Penina. Yeah, any, anybody should be able to figure that one out. Hey, Amen. We could give you a list on that. Tip. No, no that's, <laughs> that's terrible, isn't it? Like, I didn't come here for this. So he had, he had two wives. Now, in Scripture, polygamy always turned out bad. Now, there was a time where it was tolerated, but there was never an account where it actually turned out to be something that was modeled. It was never God's plan. It never turned out the right manner, even when it was uh, by notable men of faith, men like Abraham, 
or Jacob or David or the wisest of all Solomon. Amen. Uh, they, they still, it didn't work out. Uh, the Lord gave us his plan for marriage. That was one man, one woman, one lifetime. That's what God's plan was. So Hannah uh, is dealing with that. There's a lot of hurtful repercussions whenever you go against what it is that God established for the home. And she's dealing with it. Uh, notably, it's by the other wife, Penina. And uh, the fact that Penina could have children, but Hannah could not. Now, it didn't seem to bother Elkanah. Whenever you read the account, it wasn't, he's like, look, man, everything's fine. Uh, but, but it wasn't fine for, uh, for Hannah. She, uh, she just felt like there was something else that was missing in life. And, and even worse, you got Penina over there that's having kids, and she's rubbing it in. Uh, she's just bringing a, 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 a provoking against Hannah. And it wasn't short term. Verse number seven of chapter one says that it happened every year when Elkanah went to worship and sacrifice. There was that prodding there uh, against Hannah, caused Hannah to weep, caused her to stop eating. It goes on in that first chapter, says that her heart was grieved. She had a bitterness of soul. She was sorrowful in spirit. That was her condition of life. That's a miserable state to be in. Amen. If you're looking to say, okay, let me see how your life should be characterized. Grief, bitterness, sorrowful spirit, no eating, weeping. Man, that's a life of depression. That's not what it is that God established. That's a miserable state. See, she wanted a child. So she took the matter to God in prayer. Now, why did she want the child? Uh, she didn't just want to be able to say to Penina, you know, it's like, you need to be quiet now. I got a kid. You know, that, that wasn't it. It wasn't about bragging rights or anything like that. She wanted a child that God would use. That was her desire. She prayed. She said uh, in chapter 1 and verse 11, she says, if you give me a man child, I'll give him back to you. And the Lord answered that prayer. I always thought, I said, man, that, that had to be one of the hardest prayers to see answered whenever you've made that commitment to say, Lord, if you bless me with a man child, I'll commit him back to you. Because whenever he was weaned, she was going to take him to the house of God to, to be raised there uh, by Eli. I can't imagine that, can you? Uh, after you have your child, and then you have two or three of the, 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 the greatest years there, and then say, okay, it's time to give him up. You know, this is the child that was prayed for, but, but the Lord answered that prayer, and Hannah stayed true to her word. Now, whenever you see that unfold, and, and I don't know about you, I just think about her coming up to the, the house of God and saying, okay. Here he is, and then walking away. Don't think for a second that Hannah didn't love Samuel. She absolutely did. But, but her greatest love was for the Lord. Her greatest love was for the Lord. Now, if her number one love would have been for Samuel, you know what she would have done? She would have kept that boy. Amen? She would have never dedicated him uh, to the Lord. She would have just uh, determined that, you know, this, this is the one that I prayed for and I, I'm going to keep him close to me all the time. She had determined that she, uh, what it is that she wanted him to do instead of what God wanted him to do. She would enroll him in blacksmith school. She'd find him a job right around the corner from the house, make sure that he came home every day for lunch. Amen. She'd have caused him to miss out on the will of God for his life if she loved Samuel first. But she didn't. She loved the Lord first. If her number one love was for God, then she was going to trust that God had something better for Samuel than anything that she could have thought up on her own, anything she could provide for herself. So uh, the greatest thing that Samuel would ever know of his mother was that she loved God first. Can I tell you the greatest thing, mothers, that your kids will ever know is that you love the Lord first, that you love God. By the time we get to our verse, she is, uh, she's been granted just what it is that she wanted. She's, uh, she's seen the answer to that prayer. She's dedicated him back to the Lord. And we have this one verse that speaks of her identity as a mother. Now, I know I gave you a bunch of verses and different, uh, you know, uh, leading up to it. But I want us to look at this, this one verse. Now, look at what it says here in verse number 19. Uh, it says, moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. What does this tell us? First off, uh, she had a spirit of wisdom. She had a spirit of wisdom. Now I want you to stick with me on this uh, because it's going to be awesome. Amen? I'm just going to tell you it's, it's good stuff. So this is what she's got. Now look at it again real quick. Start in verse number 18 because this is important. What's that first word of verse number 18? There we go. But Samuel ministered before the Lord being a child girded with a linen ephod. And then it says, moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year. Now, uh, don't miss that little word there, moreover. 
It's going to be so important as we see that. Now, what's happening? In verse number 18, we started with that little word, but. Now, what's that telling us? There's a comparison that's going on. Amen? Or a contrast, should say. Uh, so what's taking place here in the first verses, the, uh, we start saying in verses 12 through 17, you've got some practices of godless priests. I mean, they are not doing what they, what they should. These are the sons of Eli. These are the ones that don't believe in God. They are children of Belial is what it says in verse number 12. And uh, they knew not the Lord. Now, whenever uh, what was taking place, and it goes through and it describes it, whenever someone was giving an offering, making a sacrifice, uh, then d depending on the sacrifice, they would actually get a portion of the meat. So if it was a peace offering, whatever the case. They would offer it to the Lord, but then uh, they would get uh, a portion of that as well. Now, the priest uh, was able to take, and by law, they had like the front uh, front leg and and uh, the, the the breast meat and of whatever that sacrifice was that was theirs uh, that was how God took care of the priest now they kind of changed that a little bit with the sons of Eli the sons of Eli would send a servant over and whenever there was going to be an offering they had this treble hook and uh, how many of you like to fish amen good good uh, then you're familiar with treble hooks and you know what a treble hook catches everything. Amen. Usually the things that you don't want. And uh, I mean, it's one of those things. It's almost like a trade-off whenever you're catching fish. It's like, if I got to take this thing off, I know I'm going to wear this treble hook at some point during the day. Now, now the point is, is they would send the, their, their servant over and they'd say, take the big treble hook. And there was a big hook on a handle and put it in the pot. And whatever comes up from the pot, that was the priest. Yep. Now, what are they coming up with? Everything everything. And if the people complained about it, verse number 16 said that they would take it by force. That's what was going on. Uh, this is like the little priesthood mafia. Amen? Uh, that's what they're doing. So verse number 17, uh, it says that their sin was very great before the Lord. So it's talking about this. It's talking about the sinful practices of the priesthood. And that's when you get to verse number 18 and it uses that word, but. But. A contrast. But Samuel ministered before the Lord. He stood in contrast to the unholy practices of godless priests. That's a pretty big contrast, amen? I, I, I would dare to say that's very important whenever we start to look at it and say, all right, uh, this is what was going on in the priesthood, but man, here comes Samuel. Samuel's going to do something the right way, amen? But there's that change that is, that is taking place. He ministered before the Lord. But then you get to the next verse. Now here's where it gets good. Verse number 19. First word is moreover. That's a great word. What does that mean? It means even more important. Even more of a precedent. Even, uh, even more pressing than what we've just seen. Moreover, it, it's getting the attention saying there's something else. Now think about it. What could be more important than, than a priest uh, being honorable in ministry? What could be more important than that? I'll tell you what it is. It's a mother who is helping to keep the eyes of her child on the Lord. That's what, that's what it is. Now, where Samuel stands in contrast to, to Hophni and Phinehas, which were the, uh, the two sons of Eli that were up to no good, Hannah stands in contrast to Eli. That's the big contrast that's there. The welfare of the nation depends upon a parent training up a child in the way he should go. Now, Eli wasn't doing a training of his kids. He, he let things go. There was no discipline that was taking place there on those boys. But, but Hannah, the contrast, Hannah did. Eli didn't teach his kids to respect God. Hannah did. And our verse here speaks of Hannah's wisdom, and we see it how it happens. Now, now here's the thing. He says, all right, here's what the priesthood is doing, but Hannah ministered to the Lord. Moreover, even more important than that, what Eli was doing and, and his lack of discipline, he says, more, even more important, well, here, here's this godly mother. What in the world did she do? Look at it, verse number 19. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat. You're like, wait a minute. That seems like a small thing, doesn't it? I mean, you're, you're talking about huge matters. I mean, here's Eli and his, his kids are, are just perverting the whole priesthood. And then it says, moreover, and it's making a contrast to Hannah. And, and now it says that she made a little coat. Seems like such a small thing, doesn't it? I firmly believe that, that many of the blessings that we know uh, in this church are due in part to the investments of mothers and grandmothers. Uh, that's something that we actually do see in Scripture. 
It's consistent. Paul spoke to Timothy about his influence in 2 Timothy 1.5. It says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that in thee also. He says, I see where your faith came from. There's something that was going on. I think personally about this same matter, uh, I, had a, I had a mother and a grandmother who would pray for me before every service. I think personally we, we see a lot of the success in a church because of the faithful prayers of a mother and a grandmother mm-hmm. just lifting up in prayer. And I know there's many others as well. Now, think about Hannah here. Hannah, her moreover, her great contribution was that she made a little coat for Samuel. I started thinking about that again from that personal level. My, my mother would always take me shopping for Easter. That was the big deal. Usually grandma would send some money and she'd say, I want to buy a suit too. And so that was the thing. On Easter, they'd buy me a suit, my work clothes. And uh, so anyway, so we'd, we'd go shopping. That was always a big deal. This was the first year where I wasn't able to go, and Mom just wasn't of the health to be able to go out and, and buy a suit. And she was still on me about it. Whenever she was in the hospital, she said, did you buy some clothes? <laughs> did you, you want to get, get my checkbook? I want to pay. And I was like, I'll get you the total later. I never did later this time. It's like you're off the hook. You've got other things going right now. But uh, uh, think about what it is that, that, that they were doing. They, they weren't just buying me a change of clothes. It's part of their ministry. Yeah. That's what they were doing. It was part of their investment. Today we, we use the word coat. It means a lot of different things. A lot of different things. Think about making a little coat. Uh, we, we can have different uh, things. You can have a winter coat. Amen. Amen. Uh, Ten years from now, it's still going to be new around here. Uh, you get to wear it about twice a year, maybe, something like that. Uh, handy on those two days out of the year. Um, uh, you can have a raincoat. You'll get a lot more use out of that. Hey, man, keeps you out of the weather. Sometimes you got a uh, sport coat. So you're going out, uh, going out, taking, taking your wife out to eat. You want to dress up a little bit, just put the sport coat on. Hey, man, sporty. Or you can have a suit coat for church. A lot of different ways that we, we think of with coats. Now, I'm going somewhere with this, all right? So unless you're thinking, it's like, what is the deal with this guy? It's building, okay? There was different words in the Bible for coat as well. Uh, there would be a coat like an overcoat that would help to protect from the elements. Remember, Jacob gave Joseph that coat of many colors. That's what he's talking about. It was, a, it was an overcoat that was worn. Uh, sometimes in the Bible, you'll see a coat of mail, talking about armor whenever you're going into, into battle. And Uh, And then we see this coat in our text. This coat's a little bit of a different type. This coat has to deal with the priestly garments. That's what was taking place there. Uh, It was a robe that would go on uh, over uh, the the, the priesthood clothes. There was different layers that were there. Uh, They would have a linen tunic that would go right against their their skin. And then over that, they would have a coat or a robe. And that's the word that we're actually looking at right here. That was that outer coat coat. And then on top of that, there would be the uh, linen ephod. And the ephod would have the breastplate uh, that was on top of that that represented the, uh, the, the children of Israel whenever they were ministering. Now, uh, all of those things were taking place. And I want you to see the first time that that word coat is used. So keep your spot. And I want you to turn back with me to Exodus 28. Exodus chapter number 28. And I want you to see this. It's going to be very important. Very important. Amen. So in case you're wondering, he's like, I don't know what the preacher's talking about. He's talking about mothers and then coats. I don't know. And, uh, but, you know, what wasn't the deal. And, and I'm still wondering about the moreover thing. How is it that, that, that Hannah, was, this was moreover, even more important than, than, than Eli's training of kids that are going into the priesthood? How is this godly mother's contribution of a little coat going to be more important than that? Well, here you go. Uh, Exodus 28, verse number 4 says, and these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate and an ephod and a robe. Now that word robe right there, that's the same word that's translated as coat in our text. And a broidered coat, a miter, and a girdle, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Now stay where you're at right here. Uh, Those priestly garments were all indicative of the responsibilities of the priest. Uh, As such, they were all to be used together. Amen? Uh, The the priest wasn't to go redneck and just wear his ephod. 
Amen. Uh, he wasn't supposed to do that. Everything had to be uh, put on in place, in order, uh, everything about what it, what it was that, that he was doing. The priest couldn't determine just to leave something out. Uh, just like uh, our Lord Jesus Christ is all sufficient in all things. Amen. Uh, there's nothing to be left out uh, of us. Now, where did those garments come from? Where did those garments come from? Uh, and I think about it, they didn't have a tabernacle gift shop. Hey, man, just go pick you out something, see if you find something to fit. That's not the way it worked. Look back up a verse. You're in Exodus 28. Look at what it says in verse number three. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Who was the one that was wise hearted? And had a spirit of wisdom making a little coat for Samuel year after year. It was Hannah. It was Hannah. In her wisdom, she had part of the ministry. It was behind the scenes. But Samuel would not be able to minister without her contribution. That's who Hannah is. She had a spirit of wisdom. Secondly, we see that she was personally involved. She was personally involved back in our text. I don't know about y'all, but I thought that was the coolest thing ever myself. So 1 Samuel chapter number 2, you're like, I guess, whatever. But now verse number 19, it says, Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year. Notice Hannah didn't just send it. Amen? She didn't mail it. She didn't send it by Elkanah. He could have he delivered it. Amen? She said, listen, while you're going up, up there to do sacrifice and everything, take him the coat. Put it in the box. Make sure that you don't forget. Here's the list. Bring back eggs. And, and he could have done that, but she didn't. She said she brought it to him. It was personal. I guarantee you, whenever she got there and she got the coat, you know what she did? She said, go try it on. Amen? That's what, you, never, you never just go buying clothes or anything and then don't get your kids to put it on. Not unless you like making second trips. She, she said, go look at it. She said, go, I, I want to see it. Put it on. Make sure that it fits just right. She, she brought it. It was, it was personal. And I can imagine how much whenever he would step out, she'd look and just see how much he'd grown. See, just a testimony of how much he filled, filled out that new garment. But above all, she'd be reminded of the faithfulness and grace of God. Not just for her personally, but for the whole nation. Hannah didn't just make one coat and bring it one year and then forget about it. Amen. Well, I did that that one time. I'll be back in a few years. I'm sure I will. The verse says she brought it to him from year to year. She was continually thinking about his growth, continually thinking about his ministry. She would think about him whenever she was laying out the material. Can you imagine just saying, okay, draw out my lines. He used to be this big. Oh, I bet he's about this big. His daddy was this big. She, you know, I, I can imagine her just laying all those things out and thinking about him. She'd think about how he'd grown. She'd, she wouldn't think nearly as much about the fabric as the one who was going to wear it. Amen? She was continually involved in his daily needs. It was like the prayers that are offered by a godly mother. You know, the prayer life of a godly mother is not a once a year thing. It's not just an every now and then thing. It's over and over. I watch my wife continually labor in prayer for our kids. And just because they get married doesn't mean that we say, all right, mark that one off the list, free up some prayer time. That's not the way it works. There's more to pray for, amen? She's not there to take the place of a spouse. But, you know, personally, we've been through some things. Personally, physically, spiritually. Some things we can pass along, some helpful insight and understanding, things that are going to be beneficial. You know, a mother's love and prayer for her kids will never return void. That's her work. That's her ministry that's given to her by God. My wife has such mu so much more of a, a presence of mind about our children than I've ever thought about. Sorry, kids. But usually if there's something that's, that's happening, you say, oh, we need to help out with something, it was because Kim thought about that. Dads are a little different. This dad is anyway. I'll agree. Oh, that's a good idea. But usually she's the one laboring in thought and prayer, thinking about what can be done. That's the godly mother. 
That's a ministry of, their, of her children. That brings up, lastly, her testimony of worship. Now, don't miss this one, chapter 2, verse number 19. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat, brought it to him from year to year, when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. I like that. She came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. What does that mean? She was faithful to worship. She was faithful to worship. If you look back in chapter 2, verse number 1, it says, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. Her heart rejoiced in the Lord. I can assure you, uh, she would have been overjoyed at the thought of seeing Samuel. I can promise you. I, I can just guarantee that was it. I, I imagine just the days before she couldn't hardly bring herself to sleep. I bet she would be thinking about it all the time, gathering things together, all the things that were going to be needed. But if Samuel was not there, or if Samuel had somehow been influenced by Hophni and Phinehas for a, for a season, Hannah would have continued to come and worship because her rejoicing was in the Lord. She had witnessed God's faithfulness. She knew the, the promises of God that don't expire. She, she worshiped because of the holiness of God. And I think she knew just how important it was for Samuel to see her coming to worship. Amen? I think she knew how important that was for him. Every parent should know of their own salvation and should make sure that your children know your testimony and your love for the Lord. Uh, that's something oftentimes that's just kind of put to the back, of the, the back of the list of things that are important. A lot of times parents are thinking about wonderful things that they should. Where are you going to go to school? Are you going to finish school? Are you going to graduate school? Are you going to college? Where are you going to go? What kind of job are you going to have? Are you going to make sure that you're going to be able to support a family? You're doing all those type of things. But the most important thing that they'll ever have is the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, your kids need to know, mom and dad, that you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. Not that you go to church, that's wonderful, but that you know Jesus as Savior. They need to know when you were saved. There shouldn't be a doubt of saying, I think daddy was saved. I think mom was saved. Surely they were. They, they used to drop us off at church. Then go bowling. No, that's not it at all, is it? No, they have to have the testimony. When was it? What is your testimony? What is your testimony? Your testimony is this. It's whenever you recognize that you were a sinner, that Jesus was the Savior, and you quit trying to go your own way, and instead you received Jesus as your personal Savior. Whenever you committed it all to Him, that's your day of salvation. It's whenever you, you confess that you could not do it on your own. See, whatever it is, you can fill in the blank as far as sin goes and all the things. You can make a list of all the things that were done. But ultimately, this is it. You're trusting in yourself or you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're trusting in trying to be a good enough person or you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't matter. I don't care how good of a person that you are, how much of a good old boy that you are, how many people that you help uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and pull out, of the, pull out of the mud or give them the coat off your back or whatever. It does not matter. What matters is have you received Jesus as your personal Savior? You see, sin has to be dealt with. And you can't deal with it on your own. You can't do enough good works to be able to earn your own salvation. It will not work. You've still got a sin nature. It has to be dealt with. And we can't. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what Jesus did. Jesus is God in the flesh. He came to this earth. He lived a perfect sinless life. He died on the cross at Calvary. He took every sin that you have ever committed, everything that would damn your soul to hell for all of eternity, he took it upon him and himself and endured the very wrath of God. They put him in the grave, and on the third day he rose from the grave. Why did he rise from the grave? Why is the resurrection so important? Because it was the testimony that his sacrifice was sufficient for the sins of every man. Amen. If Jesus would have ever sinned once in his life, he would have been dying for his own sins. It's pointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. He would have had to die for his own sins, but he did not. He did not sin. He took all of your sin upon himself, and whenever he died in your place, he rose from the grave. That was God the Father saying that sacrifice was sufficient to cover your sin. That was the payment. The payment was made. The propitiation was there. It was all through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now how does that appropriate? The Bible says that salvation is a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't do enough good works to get there. But God says, I've already taken care of all of it. I'm giving you salvation as a gift. And you receive it. 
Whenever you receive his gift, what do you receive? The righteousness of Christ is added to your account. And you go into heaven on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness and not your own. See, your kids need to know when was your day of salvation. Amen. Well, I just kind of started going to church one day. That's not it. That's not it. Uh, don't, don't confuse self-reformation with salvation. Don't confuse turning over a new leaf with receiving Jesus Christ as Savior. There was a day that every person had to see their own sinfulness, see the, the sacrifice of Jesus, and receive that gift for themselves. For me, I was 15 years old in a gray and white frame house, farmed to Market Road 2087 in between Kilgore and Longview. The middle bedroom, I recognized I was a sinner. I knew it. I grew up in church enough. We didn't go, we weren't very faithful, but we we would go, and it was usually about once a month, maybe twice a month, something like that. We were in church, but we had a good preacher. I knew what the plan of salvation was. I knew that just as I am would start to play, and I'd start gripping the pew. I've shared it with you before. I'd listen to Miss Hammers that sat right behind me. She could not sing at all. <laughs> I've still got her voice in my mind. I wish I could do it justice. I'd sing it for you, but I can't. But I would listen to Miss Hammers so that I wouldn't think about the conviction that the Holy Spirit was bringing on my soul. Yeah. But that day I was in my room. I was crying. I didn't know what was wrong with me. Mom came by. She walked in. She said, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't know. She said, I think the Lord's been dealing with you, and I think it's about time that you trusted him. And I wasn't going to give her that benefit. I said, okay. You know, and then she went on. But she was right. I knelt down there beside my bed. I had a tract, I had a gospel tract in my Bible that I had forever. And I followed that along. I already knew that what the plan was, but I wanted to make sure I didn't mess it up. And I went through and I did exactly what I told you. I confessed that I was a sinner. Jesus was the Savior. I said, I'm not trusting in myself anymore. I'm going to trust in Christ. And he saved me that day. Oh, my kids need to know that. They need to know that there was a place in time. There was a spot where I dealt with the Lord. Your kids need to know that as well. And I know this is Mother's Day, but dads, your kids need to know that of you as well. Amen. Oh, they need to know the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to have that wonderful testimony that their parents are saved. If you're known by your kids as one who skips worship for the smallest inconvenience, they're learning that there's something more important than Jesus in your life. And yet there's absolutely nothing more important than the Lord. Think of the instruction that was given of the importance of the Word of God. In Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7 it says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. That word diligent, you teach them diligently, it means to give your wholehearted attention to it. To make it a matter of utmost importance. To teach diligently, it means that we're to always delight in the opportunity to model what is so very important to the Lord. Mothers, I want to encourage you in this one thing. If there's things in your own life that would grieve you if they were in the lives of your children, ask God to remove those things. Make the Lord your priority. Make Him your purpose in rejoicing. You know, it's amazing. I was, I was reading through this account, and I do. I absolutely love the account of Hannah. Oh, there's so much there. So very special. I was reading through this, and it got to this one little verse, and, and it really is. It's just one verse, but that verse takes the wisdom and the work and the worship of a godly mother, all of the things that has brought her fullness in life, and gives us a testimony and says that's what a godly mother looks like. It puts it on display as she gives God the glory in her home and her family. It's my prayer that every mother here would have that same desire to rejoice in the Lord over the ministry that God has given you in life. You know, I think about our nation, and it's in as much need for godly mothers as it was in Hannah's day. Yes, sir. The turning of our nation back to the Lord could hinge on the decisions of mothers in a service just like this. Right. How about today? Could you make today the day where you determine that you're going to live for the Lord Jesus Christ? If you're not saved, would you receive Jesus as your Savior today? Would you put your faith and trust in Him and Him alone? If you are saved, why don't you determine that you're going to order your home to be able to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, let's all stand together. We'll have a hymn of invitation.
Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your love for us and great glory that's ours, Lord, just to be able to be here. And, and Father, we just pray, God, that you would do a mighty work in each of our hearts and lives. The things that we've heard of Hannah, I pray, Lord, that we would be able to see the, the wonderful significance of it that we have right here in the hour that we're in, the day that we're in, how much of a need that we have right now, Lord, just to be committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray if there's one here that is not sure if they die today, if they'd go to heaven. I pray that today would be the day where they stop depending upon themselves. They put all their trust, all their hope, all their dependence, their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the finished work at Calvary. Lord, we want to thank you for giving salvation as a gift. We thank you, Lord, for the assurance of it that you give, Lord, when we receive you. Father, I pray, God, that you would help each of us, Lord, to just to honor our Honor our Savior, Lord, in our homes and our lives. Lord, that you would get the glory of it all. We want to thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 333. 333. We're going to sing Calvary Covers It All.